whiskey, chances are you probably think of the bigger distilleries in places like Kentucky and Tennessee. But did you know that for years, a great quality product, whiskey product, was produced right here in your own backyard, right here at West Overton. And guess what? It's back. Hi, welcome to Around the Town with Marilyn Forbes. For today, we're gonna to be visiting the folks at West Overton Museum again, but today we're gonna to be going over to the distillery. And we're going to be hearing all about the product that they're making here again and tell you about the opportunities you have to come and actually hear about it yourself and even taste some. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, folks, look who we have back. Aaron is back with us today and he is going to talk on a little bit of a different subject than what we talked about last time. We're going to be talking about the distillery. Aaron, thank you. Thank you for coming. No, back. it's our pleasure and it's, it's great to have you back here. We had a lot of people come and visit us and say, we saw the show. Oh, so good. we're very grateful to have you back here. Oh, again. wonderful. That's good to hear. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk booze. Okay. Tell us about the, the beginning, how it started and what it's turned into today. Sure. So first, this building, you know, if you had asked me 10 years ago where we are, I would say we're inside of an old barn. This is a, a pre-Civil War stock barn. So it housed sort of livestock, small animals for the, the farm that was here that was 260 plus acres. In 2014, the museum began a renovation project to open a distillery here. And in 2019, 2020, we began distilling here on site for the first time in 100 years. So distilling here in West Overton closed with prohibition around 1919, okay, 1920. Yeah. Okay. But it started as early as somewhere between 1803 and 1810. Okay. You know, it's one of those things we don't have the concrete date on when Abraham Overholt began distilling whiskey. But he sort of came on the heels of the Whiskey Rebellion, which happened. A lot of focus of that was in this area, 1791 to 94. Yeah. So that had kind of ended. And then less than 10 years later, the Overholt family moved west from Bucks County near Philadelphia. And the whiskey was one of the first things that they began to do here. And it started as, and it still is today, an agricultural product used to use up surplus grains, excess grains, or less desirable grains. You know, wheat makes great bread and rye, which is a hardy crop, um, not so desirable for bread. And whenever you're clearing land out here, what was the frontier? Rye is a great first year crop. It can grow in basically dead leaf matter. So you grow rye that first year, what do you do with it? you make whiskey and farmers could typically clear one acre of land per year. So each year they're clearing more land. They have more rye to make more whiskey. Abraham Overholt's no exception. And then over the, the teens, twenties and thirties, he and the community start to realize, Hey, this guy's making a good product. And this is a family of entrepreneurs, a family of businessmen. So they begin to focus a little bit more attention on their whiskey business expanding it every couple of years. What was a, a small log cabin building was encased in stone. It was torn out, torn down. They built another one with more stills, expanded the operation. And finally, the building where we talked before about the exhibition, that building was built in 1859 and encompassed the mill and distilling all under one roof. And that was sort of the, the apex, the, the, the top of distilling here at West Overton. And uh, there were some ups and downs after that finally ending with prohibition in 1919, mm, 1920. But that in a nutshell is sort of the story of whiskey making here. And they only did, I was reading like eight gallon at a time at the beginning. That's all it, they were. It was a very, very small scale. Yeah, you know, and, and again, this is another one of those depending on what you read, where you check. Mm. Um, the taxes, I believe in 1810, said they had two 75 gallon pot stills. That doesn't mean they're making that all the time, all year round, of course. So they, they probably did make it on a small scale, but you're going to see our operation here in a little bit. And the distiller we have now is still smaller than what Abraham Overholt likely had when he started around 1810. Okay, wow. That's amazing. And and I, I think it's pretty cool that you guys are, are resurrecting it, um, getting as close to the original as you possibly can, which is neat. They're yeah. even growing uh, their own rye now, which I think is, is fun. Um, right off, off site here, or is that or is, is that on site? It's entirely on our property. Okay, I thought yeah, it was, yeah. okay. So I don't know the last time they grew rye here, um, well over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So we have five acres in the ground right now. It's going to be um, harvested here soon and it's going to be used to make our whiskey. I think last I heard, we're going to be getting around a ton. Mm -hmm. So about 2000 pounds of 
grain. And for our little operation, as you're going to see, that's going to stretch pretty far. Oh, and that'll be from seed to sip then. Entirely from seed to sip, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so are these the products here that you've Yes, you're these making? are our three products that we <clears throat> produce here. The first one on the left is our white rye. So a lot of us associate whiskey as having a brown color, sort of amber color. But when whiskey comes off the still, it is pure white, clear like water. So that clear color is what we call white. Obviously it's not, but it's a clear like water. So it's a white unaged rye. It's a distilled liquid. So it's, it's clear like water. And uh, it's not until you put it in the barrel that it takes on the, the color and the taste that we associate with whiskey. Okay. Completely unaged, completely clear. Um, that's that's what you get. So this this can be produced like all the time then. You don't have to wait for this to Correct. sit around. Okay, Correct. all right, okay, all right. So Bottom the next, we're gonna two. kind of take a break from our own product. This one, you see when distilleries first open, they don't have an aged product to sell right. because it takes time and we'll talk more about that. So they have to buy a barrel of whiskey from another distillery, bottle it, age it, bottle it, and sell it as a collaborative product. And we've had the pleasure of doing that with a gentleman named Herman, uh, a dad's hat, Mountain Laurel Spirits. He's in eastern Pennsylvania. And uh, his, his product is called Dad's Hat. In the collection, and some of your viewers might recognize this, we have a taxidermy two-headed calf. His name, their name, I don't really know is Jasper, <laughs> most famous artifact. People ask about it all the time. So this has become Jasper stash. Then the last one is our aged product. So when you take that clear product, put it into the barrel, it becomes brown like we see here. Okay. So we typically age in 30 gallon barrels. The smaller the barrel, the faster the product ages. So this takes 12 to 18 months in a barrel and uh, they're all new charred white oak barrels. And after 12 to 18 months, it takes on a caramel color. The amber color takes on vanilla flavors, caramelly flavors, sweet flavors, and creates what we associate as being whiskey. Interesting. Where do you get your barrels? So we just changed that. Um, previously, our barrels were from Zach Cooperage, which I think was in Kentucky, and Justin can correct me on that. But we just switched to a Pennsylvania-made Cooperage. Um, that I don't remember the name of, but Justin can tell you more about that because he just picked them up like two days ago. Oh, okay. So we switched finally to, we were able to find, because we searched and searched, we finally found a Pennsylvania Cooperage. So all of our products now, our rye, our barley, and our barrels are all from Pennsylvania. Oh, cool. You should start coopering here like you used to back Oh, day. yeah. Maybe you could start that program. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's a skill I'll never have. <laughs> okay. You ready? Do you want to step into the... Uh... The barrel room? Yes, yeah, the barrel sure. room. Okay. All right. Okay. We are now here in the barrel room. Okay. So explain to us a little bit about what's happening here. Yeah, sure. So this is sort of a work in progress. We have a barrel rack on its way. This is how new this entire process is for us. We're still kind of figuring things out, but this is where we age our product. Um, so we see a couple barrels here standing up and these barrels that are standing up are already emptied. So that one over there was our first barrel that we ever did. And we're still not sure what to do with that, so it just kind of sits there. <laughs> These barrels that are lying down, they're still they're still sleeping, they're still aging. This one is a 53-gallon barrel, and this is more the industry standard. So if you tour one of the bigger distilleries, you're going to see these 53-gallon barrels. These ones take about four years to age properly. Um, generally, the smaller the barrel, the faster it sure. ages. So we laid this one down just last year, so it's going to be quite a while before ready to to um, bottle that one. Now question for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you, does it stay just like this for four years or do you move it around? Or is there like a sediment issue? Uh, or? My understanding is it's gonna stay just it's like gonna this. It's gonna stay like that? Yeah, okay. it's just All gonna right. nap just like that for a while. Um, occasionally Justin will come along, he'll taste it, he'll inspect it to make sure that everything's, you know, moving along as it should and it's developing nicely. And that's what we have to do with these, especially as we get closer and closer to the time that we wanna dump them. We examine them visually, we smell them, we taste them to make sure that we hit it at the right time. There's sort of like this ebb and flow that happens inside of the barrel and we want to catch it at the right moment. Okay. If we let it sit in the barrel too long, it over oaks, much like you might over steep your tea. Oh, it takes okay. on a bitter sort oh, of tea, okay. that, that kind of flavor and we don't want that in our whiskey. So there is a danger that it can be in there for too long. Now see, I was, I was actually going to ask you that. I thought I thought exactly the opposite. Yeah, that you would think longer, the longer yes. it is. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure there are some things that are like that, but um, for, for whiskey, for rye, um, definitely there's there's a sweet spot to hit. 
Wow. So Justin has a mash going right now, but the last barrel that we have to bottle right now is this one here behind me. This is our barrel three. Okay. And um, it's probably going to be dumped any day, any time, um, whenever Justin finds the time. But it's it's okay. It's not in danger of over -oaking. It's just kind of just about right where we want it to be um, to dump it. And then by dumping it, that means you're bottling it? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I don't mean we're dumping it down the drain. <laughs> yeah, we're going to We're tired of it. Just dump it. Yeah, we're, we're tired. We're done. So, so then, he, he can talk more about that process okay, as well. Okay. He does all of that. Okay. So anything else on the... So we got a couple more barrels over there, Saja. And that one there is our barrel from Dad's Hat. Well, so this here, we, this mm -hmm. one? Okay. We talked about that Jasper stash, and that was the barrel that we dumped from, from Dad's Hat to do that. Um, so are we ready to meet up with Justin then? And We are, just one more thing. Um, the product that we make is called Monongahela Rye. Okay. Right? And there are several different styles of rye. There's a Maryland rye, Kentucky rye. And we're still in this area figuring out what Monongahela rye means. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So nobody really can say definitively. And I think distillers in the state now are finally just like, all right, let's sit down and figure out what exactly we mean when we're saying that. But traditionally, it's considered to have 80% rye, 20% malted barley, as our product does, like Justin will explain. Historically, it would have been aged in a steam-heated warehouse. Um, unlike in other parts of the country where the, the warehouses are sort of at the whim of the weather, a lot of distilleries around this area before Prohibition had heated warehouses. Oh. Some distillers called it a, a summer all year round. Is that, does that speed up the process, the heat? Uh, I, I, don't okay. I don't think it speeds it up. I think it just creates a, a, a distinct, consistent flavor. Okay. And of course, we're near the Monongahela River, uh, the geographical proximity to the Monongahela. So those those are the couple things that we say are Monongahela, but there are some references to people using corn historically. The Overholtz produced a wheat whiskey as well. So we're still playing with that, but that's why our product is called Monongahela Rock. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. We ready to We're ready to go meet Justin. Okay, now. all right. Yeah. All right. So how do we do this? How do we make whiskey? Okay. Well, okay. So <laughs> let me first say don't take don't listen too closely to what I say. There's two reasons I say that. One is you can't legally distill in your own home. Okay. It is illegal to do it at your home, just so you know. Uh, the other reason I say don't, you know, I warn everybody about being too interested in how you make your alcohol. Because sometimes it's better just to enjoy drinking it. You know, <laughs> let somebody else worry about making it. You come in, you drink it, don't take, it becomes an obsession is why I say that. Um, but yeah, I'll walk you through the okay. process, just general knowledge. So right. this would be the first major piece of equipment that we use in whiskey production or any distilled, or really any alcohol production, a lot of alcohol production. This is called our mash tun. Um, this is steam heated. So as you can see, those uh, black pipes that come out of the wall, there's an industrial sized boiler in the, in the room behind us. It produces steam that runs through a um, manifold in the bottom of this and it heats up our water. This can hold about 300 gallons of water. We never put that much in it at a time. 120 gallons is about a normal run for us of water. That also needs to have room for about 250 pounds of grain in it. So you need room for that grain also. Okay. So that's about the max that we can safely do in here, about 120 gallons at a time. So what you do is you uh, bring the uh, water, your water temperature up to a certain point and it's a point known to distillers to be when the grain will release their sugars. Because that's the key to all this, sugar production. The hot water releases the sugar, and at the end you have something that's almost like a porridge. And if you drink it, it kind of tastes almost like a sweet tea. So after you have, you know, you've done that long enough, then we'll move on to the next piece of equipment, um, which are these fermenters over here. And that's actually what we have going on right now. So each one of these is about 50 gallons. Uh, it can hold 50 gallons, but we need a little bit of head space so that the yeast can do its work. But So we put that in there and then we add a yeast to it. And that's the key to all of it. The yeast eat the sugar that we release from the mash. And there's a few byproducts that it creates. One is a gas. Okay. So that's why it's bubbling like okay. this because all that gas is escaping into the water. The reason we put it in the water is it's sanitized. That prevents anything from going back up 
from the environment into there because you can get things like infection or bacteria in there that you don't want to that'll ruin your flavor and ruin your product hmm. so um the other thing luckily for us that it produces other than gas is ethanol oh, okay. which is just alcohol that we sure. drink so um but then we have the problem of okay we have ethanol but we also have it mixed in with uh dead yeast cells and all these spent grains and you know those other byproducts so we have to separate the two and that's where distillation comes in and that's where really beer separates beer and distilled okay. um alcohols diverge so if this were a beer you would have separated the grains out already and your final product once you took it off the dead yeast cells you would have your beer and you'd be done you carbonate it chill it you're ready to go we have to take it to the um the still here so forgive the hose over it right now but um so this is uh a 50 gallon still so we can um distill about 50 gallons at a time so about one of those full um, and what it does is it runs on the same steam, steam system as the mash tun. So instead of going over to there, the steam comes into here and starts heating it up again from the bottom. And there's a fan in there that rotates it and kind of stirs it to keep it from burning, staying in one spot and burning on the bottom because that'll produce off flavors. Um, but the key to it, this stage, is that ethanol and water have a different boiling point. So Luckily, ethanol has a lower boiling point than water. So as it starts to boil, it's, it's released as vapor. Ethanol will come up as vapor. And it'll run through our uh, still head here, which uh, it's always copper, or should always be copper, and copper helps ionize it, take out some of the impurities. It's really almost like running it through a filter. Oh, okay. um, so then it hits this column here. In this column, actually, it's not running right now, but we can run uh, cold water through it. And when that vapor comes up through the head and hits this column that's cold, it recondenses back into a liquid. There's something called the heads, hearts, and tails. So your heads you don't want to drink. Those are the first things that come off. And you can tell by the smell. They have a, a, a it's hard. It's a difficult to explain smell, but it's not good. Okay, I'll tell you that. Don't make me smell. So that actually, I tell everybody, is part of the reason why distillation at home is unsafe. Um, during prohibition, when you'd hear about people going blind from alcohol, making their own alcohol, it's because they didn't realize how dangerous methanol was for you. So they didn't remove that, and in large quantities, um, it can blind you. It can even kill you. I mean, actually, in the, I shouldn't say large quantities because it's really not that much. Oh so uh, there is a, sa a major safety concern. Another safety concern is this produces a lot of flammable vapor, so it, it can cause an explosion. Um, and it, some of these parts can be, become pretty pressurized, which can also cause an explosion. So, um, so, but that's the methanol. That comes out first. You can tell when it's done by the smell. Um, you just throw that away. Yeah, there'll okay. be a noticeable change in smell, and then that's when you get into your hearts, and that's the heart of the whiskey. Um, that's where it produces the flavor that we're most most used to. It has the highest ABV. Um, ABV. Alcohol by volume or proof. Okay. okay. We'll say proof okay. for for a liquor. Okay. Um, and then it'll switch into the tails, which tails are not dangerous either. I mean, they're drinkable just like. Um, the hearts are, but they're a little bit sweeter. Okay. The, the smell and the taste is a little bit sweeter. So we try to separate those out. What we do is we separate those out. We'll add a little bit of those to the next batch that we do. Oh, okay. And then we can try to extract a little bit of um, ethanol out of those, you know, so those you to keep it from them. being wasted. Those right, we, okay. we keep right. the tails, right. Right. So, and then after that, um, we have our uh, products. Like we, we then have a white rye like Aaron explained to you yeah. out there, um, we can take that, bottle it immediately, from and... Right here. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, it has to be in a... It goes yeah, into okay. a storage yeah. tank okay. first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't hook the bottler up to that, unfortunately. It would make it easier, but... Uh, but yeah, then we can bottle that right up, and usually from about 120 gallons in a run right there, we might get 15 gallons of... Okay, of so that's average then? Alcohol, too. yeah. That's... In, in some places, might be able to get a little bit more efficiency out of it 
but we are doing a lot of things here by hand. So there's a lot of room for, not error, but just deviation from run to run. Um, and, you know, we're not automated like the big distilleries are nowadays. Um, I was in here yesterday for 10 hours. I mean, I stir that by hand, I transfer it by hand. I mean, we have pumps and things like some conveniences, but compared to other places, we're very manual here. Now, are you, are you doing this year round? Yeah, so uh, we produce a certain amount per year. And um, the process does take a while. You know, for one barrel, it could take you 15 days. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's never ending. No. But that's, I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't roll it. I didn't know if you did it year round or if this was just something you did seasonal or. Uh, no, oh, I mean, the property is open seasonally, but the distillation will continue even in, um, in times that the, the properties, the museum's closed for the season. Okay. Um, People don't realize it, but probably, in my opinion, the hardest part of this whole process is the bottling. Okay. You know, it's we manually put the, the labels on, so I'm, I'm particular about making sure they're straight. We manually cap it. We manually put the seal on the cap. We manually write the proof in the uh, yeah the proof in the ABV on the bottle. So everything's manual. Like I said, a whole day will be just bottling one barrel. Well, see, that's crazy. Two days. That's, that's what sets you apart from right. the bigger distilleries. It, it is really, it's, you can pretty much say it's how it used to be made. Right. And speaking of which, can we face that? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, stick with us, guys. They're gorgeous, though. I like the logo. That's very nice. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's it's classic yet, yet modern. It has that simplicity, that sleekness, but it's still, like I said, I think it's still classic. It was really important for us to get these from Pennsylvania to have a 100% Pennsylvania product. So uh, this week I picked these up from a cooperage called East Coast Wood Barrels. But this is made in Clinton County in uh, a town called Beach Creek. Probably most familiar to people, it would be near uh, a little bit north of State College or Belfont, if you're familiar with that area. So uh, they use um, uh, Pennsylvania grown white oak, American oak. Uh, they char them for us on site, they roast them for us on site. And once we get those racks in, our barrel room will be transformed and when someone looks in there, uh, they're gonna have a really nice view. Of, they're gonna know instantly that there it was to everything. Okay, yeah. let's go taste some. Yep. Okay, now we're getting to the fun part. Yeah, this all is right. what all the work <laughs> is about. <laughs> okay, so tell me what we're gonna be drinking and... Okay, so these are our three products that we have for sale right now. This is our white rye. So this is this came off the still in there um, and then never touched a barrel. So it goes straight from still to uh, bottle. Uh, some people who say that they don't like whiskey, which we hear that a lot, say that they like this. I, um, it has a unique flavor for sure. We use it um, as a substitute for things where you might use a vodka or a uh, tequila. I'll let you try that. I'll, I think... Aaron thinks it has a grassy smell. I do pick up a grass smell in it. I also think it's a little um, fruity though. You know what? That's really not bad. No. <laughs> well, thanks. And, you know, and, and it does. It smells like tequila. Now that right. you said that. Mm -hmm. Tastes like it too, I think. Mm. Like maybe a, if, if tequila has a hundred percent flavor profile. This might be a, a little bit of a muted tequila, gentler tequila. That's really tequila. different. I like. Mm -hmm. I actually like. This. That's why people. That's why people who oftentimes, like I said, tell us that they don't like whiskey. They like that. Oh, okay. Because it's such a different flavor. Okay, I'm gonna. I don't know. I don't know how much this is gonna. No, that'll to be good. Yeah, that'll be good. We usually clean the glasses in between anyway. Okay. So this one, um, the next one is our. This one's aged in a barrel. This one was our collaboration between Dad's Hat out in Eastern PA. It's a rye just like we produce here. The whisk, uh, the mash bill, and the process, very, very similar to what we do. But just because of the variation in production and little touches here and there, it actually has a very different flavor from ours, even mm -hmm. though it's in a lot of ways very, very, very similar. So let's try that one. And Dad's Hat has been a very good um, friend of our distillery here. Um, he may live in Eastern PA now, but he's from this local area originally. This smells like I would think whiskey would smell like. So, I don't know what that, that, that <laughs> means. Perception is so individual. I like his water. <laughs> Everybody, you can, hey, you everybody's you different. You can tell, it is, it is, it's distinctly different. Right. And 
do you can you almost does it taste like what you would think oak would taste like when it do you think the barrel is what changed that flavor i would i would i would think right. so i guess yeah that's just i just curious there mm, okay all right all right and then this door number three is the one i can't wait for you to try <laughs> and for everybody to try we are very very pleased with how this one turned out this is our um fully produced in a house here aged um a little over uh 18 months so a year and a half um this one is 98 Point seven proof. Oh. We tried to be a little cheeky and get it right at 98.6, the body temperature, but uh, hey, point 0.1 is not bad. Um, but I, we all think this is delicious. So when we when we go for a play, flavor profile here, we don't standardize a proof. We try to standardize a flavor, and that flavor may come out at different proofs um, depending on the batch. Oh, he's going to have one with me. Yeah. Okay. This one's so good, like I said. <laughs> Go. Oh, that's good. Mm. People who don't, who say they like whiskey, but they usually can't drink it straight, will say that they could sit and drink that straight that all day. That is really good. I'm, I, that is really good. It's surprising, isn't it? Yeah. There's a sweetness, there's that oakiness there, and there's a little bit of spice, but there's a surprising amount of sweetness. There's something I can't. There's some kind of spice or something I can't. Mm -hmm. that, that, yeah, usually that I the, don't normally... the rye would people hmm. people would think would be a spicier. Would usually come off as a spicier flavor. That is good. Now, yeah. one thing, great news for everybody is everybody can come and do this too. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We so we have the the sampling that you just did here today would actually uh, is no cost, but uh, we do sell these three products. We're open for tasting and sales every Saturday and Sunday during the season. Um, from uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay, so we'll have a bartender here, bring your friends. We're part of the Laurel Highlands Pour Tour. So if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, it's put on by the uh, Laurel Highlands Visitor Bureau, and they've put all of the local distilleries, breweries, wineries into a program where you can get this little passport. Every place gives cool. you a little passport stamp. After, if you visit enough or all of them, the Visitor Bureau will give you t-shirts, cool prizes. Oh, wow. So we're part of the Pour Tour. So. You can't finish that without coming here. And also, too, you guys uh, feature two cocktails, two different oh, yeah, cocktails yeah. a month? So every month we'll uh, feature two different cocktails that we make in-house. Um, they're usually uh, whiskey-based, or because of the versatility of that white rye, we can make um, tequila or vodka okay. cocktail, cocktails, cool. too. And also, too, um, they are going to have, they are going to be open possibly a couple extra days here and there. So the best thing to do is just go on their website and check the hours. Yeah, our Facebook version. is probably the most um, up-to-date, current place to find all those information, whether it's about the museum or uh, live history days here or distillery events. Okay, so awesome. So then there you go, folks. You can come and you can taste. And you can purchase, and you can really just be a part of history. This, this, even the building itself here is so charming. You guys did such a great job. So thank you. Anything else you'd like to add? No, today? thanks for coming. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. This is great. This was tasty and fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. I know I did. I had a lot of fun, and I think it was very interesting seeing how they're pretty much bringing history back to life. Uh, as you can see, I'm standing here in a field of rye. So they are indeed going from seed to sip. Thanks again to the folks at West Overton. Big thanks to Aaron and Justin for taking the time to do the show with us. Hope you folks did enjoy it. And make sure you check out their Facebook or their website to get the hours of tastings if you'd like to come and try these great products for yourself. So again, I hope you enjoyed the show. And remember, keep smiling, keep dreaming, and keep watching. Jeez. <laughs> oh, That's I it. You're cut off. I tripped on my pant leg. You're cut off. <laughs>